Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this very special author interaction of the 2022 NLF Reading Challenge. My name is Karthika. We are very excited to be here, and we hope you are too. The NLF Reading Challenge is a four-month-long reading event from March to June 2022, involving students between 10 to 13 years of age. It runs for participants on the competitive and the non-competitive tracks. We have students from across India participating in the challenge. In addition to fun book-based activities and regular author interactions, the challenge will conclude with a quiz competition that will see the three best teams win gold, silver, and bronze in grave trophies, respectively, certificates of achievement, and a great set of books. Before we dive into the interaction, we just wanted to let you know to please use the Q and A box to type out your questions or your responses to what's being discussed during the session. If you're a student, a teacher, Or a school librarian, please mention the name of your school along with your question as well. Today, we are privileged to have with us an author whose words can lend any page with a timeless quality. Keep the camilo. The theme of hope and belief amid impossible circumstances is a common thread in much of her writing. Kate is a rare two-time winner of the Newbery Medal for *The Tale of Despero* and *Flora and Ulysses*. The Illuminated Adventures. Her middle grade novels include Because of Win Dixie, as well as The Tiger Rising, which was made into a film earlier this year. Kate has also written picture books and early chapter books, which include Bink and Golly, the Mercy Watson series, and the Tales from Deckard Drive, Drive series. Today, Kate will speak with us about her most recent novel, The Beatrice Prophecy, illustrated by two-time Caldecott Medal winner Sophie Blackall. This book tells the tale of a girl named Beatrice. Who experiences great loss is not allowed to be herself, but finds care from three very special people and one indomitable goat who become her family. Welcome, Kate. We are beyond thrilled to have you with us today. I I was smiling at you even before I had my my screen on because I loved、uh, indomitable goat and I love that description of the book that.、Um, She's not allowed to be herself, and she finds three people plus a goat that help her become herself. Yeah, that's that was a beautiful introduction. I'm so so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Kate. I'm sure our audience is really looking forward to hearing more from you. Would you want to do a reading from your book for us? I, I would like to do a reading if if y'all are okay with that. The book,、um, as you so beautifully、uh, set it up, it is about becoming yourself, and、uh, it takes place in a time uh, and uh, circumstances where、uh, girls are not allowed to read or write, and it is against the law for them. To do either one of those things, and so it's very much a book, not only about becoming yourself, but about、um, the power of the written word and、uh, the power of story and how we can find ourselves through a story. And so,、um, in the course of the book, one of those friends that Beatrice makes is、uh, a boy named Jack Dory, who is about her age, and she finds out that. He can't read. Only a handful of people can read in this world, and they are all men—men men who are in charge.、Um, and the people can't read either. So Jack Dory cannot read. Beatrice is appalled, and she decides she's going to teach him. And that's、uh, chapter thirty-four that I'm going to read to you from.、Um, <clears throat> each letter has a shape, Beatrice said, and each letter has a sound. And you put these shapes and sounds together, and they become words. Do you understand? I, he said to her. His heart was beating fast. He did not know. He had not understood how much he wanted it to know the secret of letters and sounds and words. But his heart, pounding against his rib cage, was telling him. He and Beatrice were bent together over a piece of parchment. And Swalika was leaning over them, staring down at the parchment too. She gave off a tremendous smell of goat. You said, Jack Dory, are in my way. He gave and Swalika a small shove. She butted her forehead against his, shoving him back. 
Canuck was gone, where he had gone, they did not know. He was off on whatever mysterious errand a man who had once been king and was king no more might need to attend to. It begins with this, said Beatrice. This is the letter A, and it is the first one. She formed the letter. A, he repeated. He smiled. There are 26 letters in all, she said. You will learn each of them, and once you know them, you can mix them as you will and then use them to form the words of the world and the things of the world. You can write of everything, what is and what was and what might yet be. Jack Dory nodded. The inside of Canuck's tree was snug. There was the smell of beeswax burning and also, of course, the smell of goat. The bee buzzed around Jack Dory's head, a granny bib speak beside him saying, learn it, my beloved, learn it all light of my heart, river of my soul. A is for Abelard. That is my family name. A is also the letter that begins the name and Swalika. The goat let out an approving grunt. The rest of the 26, the next of the 26 is B. She bent her head and formed the letter. B is the first letter of my name, Beatrice. And from there to C. What word begins with C? Asked Jack Dory. Canuck said Beatrice. And when will we get to the Jack Dory letters? Soon, said Beatrice. He watched the letters appear one by one beneath her hand. And he felt as if each letter were a door pushed open inside of him, a door that led to a lighted room. The world, said Beatrice to Jack Dory, can be spelled. <clears throat> I could feel you listening. <laughs> That's so lovely. It's uh, such a wonderful, perfect passage to read aloud. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. I could, I could feel it even across all these many miles and all these time zones. So yeah, true connection from the teacher. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that. Thank you. I bet you, you have questions. I know that you do. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I, I saw them in advance. And as I said to you, when we were backstage, I didn't look at them because I trust you so much, but I am ready to lead wherever, uh, I mean, follow wherever you lead. Thank you so much for that, Kate. So one of the things that really struck us when we were reading it is the fact that Beatrice doesn't shy away from being the girl that she is. She can read and write in a world that doesn't allow her to do so. And she finds people who care for her but she also in turn gives them something as well. So for instance, there's brother Edic, whose love for Beatrice helps him heal from the impact of the harsh decisions that his father imposed on him. There's Enswelika, who basks in the knowledge that she's her own goat and no one else's. <laughs> there's Jack Dory, who is led to better harness his prodigious talent. Um, there's Kanuk, who's able to find balance between what is expected of him and what he wants to do. And there's also a story in the book of a girl who's, um, who sees a king who's cursed turn into a wolf, and she's the only one who sees him for the king that he is. She's the only one who sees the glint of a crown beneath his fur. And it feels like Beatrice embodies the spirit of that girl in the effect that she has on all of these people around her. She helps them realize who they are and be led to where they belong. In addition, so in addition to them caring for her, she also enables them to find themselves. So is that how you imagined her to be, where she's able to do that without driving uh, too hard on the message? Uh, no. And, and, you know, it's funny because uh, I, before we came on, I was saying to you that the book has been out now for um, six months and um and that i learn from my readers about what the book is about and that is something that in the past six months of talking about this book and being questioned about this book and meeting uh the readers of this book no one has said to me before and it is a it is a beautiful beautiful concept and not at all what i was thinking when i was writing it because if I was thinking it, I would mess that beautiful message up. But as I listened to you say that, I thought, um, yes, that's true. And it's also what 
uh, it, it's that Beatrice sees everybody, right? She sees them and that allows them to become their truest selves. And that's what um, we can, the gift that we can give each other and also the gift that story can give to us, even if um, we can't find it someplace else, we can feel seen in a book, have our experience recognized and then go on to be the self that we are, are meant to be. So does that make sense? It does. It's a beautiful question. It, 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 and again, it, it's making me tear up because it's, it's such a profound reading uh, and understanding of the book and it helps me understand the book. Thank you, Kate. We have some, we have an audience question for you um, okay. from Ishan Jain, who asks you, is any part of the book based on any of your experiences? Mm -hmm. And where do you find the inspiration for plot characters and other details for your novels? Yeah, so I'll do the easier part first, which is, um, is anything in here based on my own experience. And this goes to that uh, thing of not always knowing what I'm doing when I sit down to write a story. And it wasn't, this book is dedicated to my mother. And it wasn't until uh, I was uh, in what we call uh, second pages. That's where you're looking at the book and it's typeset and you can, you're, it's your last chance to catch mistakes and stuff. And as I was reading it, that passage that I just read to y'all, it, it's like, I, I realized that I needed to dedicate the book to my mother because I was a kid who struggled to learn how to read um, and desperately, desperately wanted to read. But uh, we were taught, uh, a, a, uh, with phonics and for whatever reason phonics didn't make any sense to me and so I remember coming home from school and saying to my mother just like pretty hysterical because I knew I needed the word so much I don't understand what they're talking about I can't do this and my mother um, said calm down uh, we'll just find a way around it and uh, what she did was uh, instead of trying to get phonics into my head, she just, she knew my mind well enough, knew that I was good at memorizing. She just, um, she made me flashcards and I, I memorized each word. And that's how I learned to read every day. I would come home from school and my mother would quiz me on, on the words. And that feeling that Jack Dory has that, that when he sees the letters and it's like somebody had, it's, it's like walking through a door into a lighted room. That was the feeling I had when my mother um, had me memorize those words. And so this book is so grounded in that experience of mine. And as for uh, the plot and um, the characters and the arc of the story, all of those things, I don't plot out in advance. Um, and so it makes writing relatively terrifying, um, also exhilarating and also always a surprise because just when we were talking about this deeper reading um, of, of the, the, there are always surprises for me in the story um, because I don't know what's going to happen. And, and I always feel like the story is in charge and my job is to get out of the way and, and, uh, and, and, and out of the way of my own ego and let the story tell me. So there you go. <laughs> I hope it's a good that, question. Yeah, I hope Ishan Jain has taken lots of notes from your response. <laughs> so, Kate, something that we noticed um, looking at the Beatrice prophecy and your novel so far, you know, we've seen the story build as the characters explore their relationships with themselves, with their peers, um, in neighborhoods, in small towns, or we see the world through a small sized being's eyes like we do with a resilient China rabbit or an enormously brave mouse. Mm -hmm. And each of these characters is fighting against the odds. But it feels like the odds are larger in the Beatrice prophecy um, because it feels like the whole world is telling Beatrice to be someone that she can't be. Um, and it feels like as a writer as well that you're working with a bigger canvas. There's also the fact that chapter two begins with the sentences all of this took place during a time of war. Sadly, this does not distinguish it from any other time. It was always a time of war. And as we speak today, there's a very visible war that's being waged, where children play games and librarians hand out books in bomb shelters as the world goes to pieces around them. They're striving to find hope in dark times. 
Do you think writers anticipate their stories serving as mirrors to what's happening in real life at some point? Ah, uh, again, I'm crying. Um, say the question for me again because I was so caught up in that picture you painted. You know, of kids in mom shelters. Yeah, reading But, books. Yeah. So, do I think that writers? Sorry. Actually, it goes to what you've said before in your conversation with Matt Delapena, which is to make the truth more bearable. And in the context of how you were talking about how do writers balance the darkness in the world, could possibly bring to mm. people's lives. So, is mirrors to what's happening in real. anticipate that um but i know that my heart is not different from other hearts and what my heart um uh, so what my heart wants is comfort and love and what my heart sees is desperation and suffering I know that that's the way of the world, right? And I know that there is comfort and love, and then it can be found. Uh, so I'm sorry for crying. It was just, um, it's such a relevant question. So I am working to comfort myself as I tell the stories. And hopefully um, it will comfort the reader as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Thanks for that, Kate. Yeah, thank you. I'll try to get myself together now. We'll, we'll sort of, we'll give you some two very practical questions that have come to <laughs> Okay, all right. From our audience. Uh, there's Jahan Thakur who asks you, if there's a particular writing strategy that you use when you're writing your books. And we have an interesting question from Shishti Nayak who asks you, what happens to Brother Edik after the events of the book? Ah, Oh, yes, those are very good practical questions that will get me out of um, my teary self. So do I have a writing strategy? I do. I tend to be what my friends think of as very rigid in that I feel like the best way to get something done, because I'm always afraid to write, is to get up and do it right away in the morning and to do just a little bit every day. So that is my primary writing strategy is to get up, to go down uh, when uh, everything is still dark before I can talk myself out of doing the work. I just, I do a little bit, two pages. And I have found through the years that um, no matter what I'm doing and how busy life is um, or how overwhelmed I feel, Uh, that I can, I can, I can find the time to do those two pages and that, and that it's best to do them before I do anything else and have the chance to talk myself out of them. So that's kind of, that is my primary writing practice. And then Brother Attic, who I love so much and who, whose tender heart moves me so much. What happens to him after the book? You know, and uh, it, it's lovely because the last time we see him in the book, he's writing down and illustrating the story that Beatrice has told herself about the mermaid. Um, and I have this, it's funny because no one's ever asked this question before, but I have this feeling in, in a circular kind of way that Beatrice and like, he's writing that story the story of the mermaid, but he's also writing the story of Beatrice. And so it's like, you know, in a weird way, I, I am him and I have access to him. So does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. I think she will also agree with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of the mermaid story, Kate, we, we've seen this gorgeous muscle shell book that Sophie Blackle made you with yeah. the story of the mermaid. And you've said that you keep it on your desk, that it fills you with light and possibility in moments of doubt. 
Um, we've also seen the gorgeous gift edition that Candy Bit Press has made for the Beatrice Prophecy with the ribbon enclosure, with the story on a scroll. Um, yeah. And in the alcove in the book, it, it looks gorgeous. Um, and it's clearly an edition that will occupy pride of place on any bookshelf. It's, <laughs> it's the sort of book that people could bequeath from parent to child. One book will fill readers with the same sense of light and possibility that Sophie Seashell book does for you. Yes. What a wonderful thing that would be. And, you know, I heard from um, uh, a mother who wrote to me about her uh, child who um, wanted a robe that looked like Beatrice's robe and had the gift edition and made her own scroll and um, wanted to write her own story on the scroll and, and, and wrap it in with the story of, of Beatrice's mermaid. And to me, it was just like, uh, that, that's it. How lovely to write your own story, to add your story to, to Beatrice's story. And, and that's, that's so much of what I hope people um, will take away too, the, that they will feel empowered to tell their own stories. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah. We have an, in, one more writing question that's come to you from Rena Rathod from Fountainhead School, who asks, what part of the book did you have the hardest time writing? Oh. Well, I'll take a long roundabout way to answer this because um, I, you know, I wrote, uh, my, my mother had passed away. And I began this book the, the summer after she, she passed away. It was 2009. And I wrote like the first 50 pages of it. Um, and then I, um, I put it away. I, I forgot about it entirely. Um, and it wasn't until eight years later when I was cleaning out a closet and I found it at the bottom of the closet. And I had been away from it so long that it seemed like something that I had had nothing to do with. And I was able to read it and see that there was definitely a story there and also that the story needed to be finished. So it was, it was a hard book to write in general because, so from that point on, I felt duty bound and that I had to tell it. And that was like, um, that was probably the hardest part was knowing that as difficult as it was, and it had all these strands, it is, as you said, a bigger canvas um, and a more, uh, it's a challenging book and it's, um, and it, it's beyond my capabilities. <laughs> um, that's what I felt the whole time I was writing it, but I felt I had no choice but to write it at, uh, to the best of my abilities. And so that's kind of what made it hard that 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 I felt duty bound to do it and I also knew that it was a real stretch for me as a writer okay. thank you for that Kate. that's such an honest response from a writing question Kate um, we're four minutes away so I think this might be the last question that they asked you oh, okay. to a reading question now you've spoken about how the Beatrice prophecy is about the joy and power of reading about sharing stories and it's about storytelling and you've also said that when a child discovers reading, it's her own entirely. It's a gift, it's a privilege, and it sets a child forth on her journey. And it comes down to finding one's book, finding the book that does that for you. Um, and as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, you've had the opportunity to meet countless students, teachers, librarians, parents. What advice would you give for those who haven't yet found a book that speaks to them, that sets them on their reading journey? And how might teachers, librarians, and parents help with this? Uh, that's another beautiful question. Um, and, and I automatically think of myself as a reader uh, and, and, how, and, and again, of my mother who paid so much attention to me 
um, as a reader and was always like, she kind of knew what books I would like and need. And uh, one of those it, it, that I remember so vividly is Paddington um, I'd, about uh, the bear who um, comes from darkest Peru, right. And is a, and is alone in the world and finds a family. And, and that story resonated with me so much. And then I, I still come back, but it's so funny too. Paddington is always, it's, it's a very funny book. And so I, I, for, I would say to teachers and librarians, pay attention to the heart of the kid. And, and you, you know, if you see their heart, you can see the story that, that might set them on, on their path to reading. And for the kids themselves, if you have not found a book yet, and if no one has put the right book in your hand, um, just keep an open eye and an open heart. The right book is out there. Sometimes it's the book that helps you recognize yourself. Sometimes it's the book that uh, comforts you. Sometimes it's the book that uh, tells you who you can be. That book is out there. And if, if no one else helps you find it, you can find it. And, um, and it is that feeling of walking into a lighted room. You'll know it when you find it. Um, and, and everybody gets something different from the book that opens that door, but you will find that book. I believe that absolutely. Thank you for that, Kate. I really hope that all the readers out there who haven't found their book yet do find it too. Um, but this is great advice for anyone who's looking to work with children on developing and growing their reading. Thank you, Kate, for joining us today. This has been a lovely half hour. It just passed by in a blur of warmth and hope and honesty. So thank you for taking the time to do this with us. Uh, it felt like five minutes. It felt like no time at all. And uh, I'm so grateful to you for um, your beautiful questions, your large heart, and your tolerance for me as I weep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. You are an absolute pleasure to research. And it's just lovely to be able to read and interact with you about your work. And we wish you all the very best with all the writing that is to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.